Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the African American Safety and Justice Committee on behalf of the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus. I am the chair of this committee, Representative Anamdi Chukwocha, and I, I am thankful that you all have joined us for our second meeting of our Safety and Justice Subcommittee. We will begin our meeting with our introductions and we will go through to see which members are, are present. Representative Chukocha. Present. Julius Mullen. Alex Mackler. James Diana. Present. John Stevenson. Present. Lisa Minutola. Present. Tana Connell. Michelle Ratcliffe. Karen Holland. James Sherrard. Present. Spencer Price. Present. Gilmore Crosby. Present. Kyle Myers, Tinietta Congo. Present. That concludes the attendance. We do have a quorum. Thank you. The minutes have been distributed from our last meeting. Are there any corrections to those meetings, minutes? If there are no corrections, the minutes are approved as distributed and please let the record reflect that. Next slide. We wanted to spend a little time this morning before we jump into our discussion. We have two, two members of our subcommittee who at our, our last meeting uh, were uh, afforded the opportunity to introduce themselves or to speak about safety and justice from the lens of their organization or department. So we wanted to yield the, the floor to first, we wanted to Ms. Congo to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the subcommittee members and to speak about your relationship to safety and justice. Okay, thank you. Good morning. My name is Tynita Congo. Um, I started a foundation in my son's honor called Jamil Akeem Congo Cares. And what we do is we provide support for those affected by gun violence. I lost my son to gun violence February 21st, 2017. And I live in the heart of Wilmington, basically, in, in the, the the crime area where it's um, most prevalent. And it bothers me to see our young people just out in the streets and not having anything to do and you know no programs or anything for them to really participate in. And it's just, you know, I'm, some days I'm scared to just go outside because the gun violence is so rampant in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Congo, and thank you for your presence and your just willingness to be a part of our subcommittee and to bring your voice into this conversation. Uh, during our, our initial conversation, when, when we first met, you, you said something to me that really touched my heart about just, just the impact that it has on your life, losing your son, and, and just being in that community. I mean, it means so much, and to me, that's really the, the same sentiments that wanted me so strongly to, to, to fight and argue and, and, and want our legislative caucus to truly address this issue of, of gun violence and community violence 
because of, of the impact, that impact that it has on, on family members, the impact that it has on, on our communities and what we truly need to do as a collective body to address that. So again, thank you for your participation. The, the next person we wanted to allow to introduce themselves and to, to speak about uh, safety and justice is Captain Fahim Akil from the Wilmington Police Department. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Good morning. I'm uh, again, I'm Captain Fahim McKeel with the Wilmington Police Department. I've been on the department for 35 years. Um, it's spanned over uh, over 10 chiefs and I've seen changes, um, you know, throughout uh, the time and the tenure I've been here. What I first like to say is before I get into what actually law enforcement has done, I think what we need to look at is how we got here. Um, what, what, what are the systemic things, what things cause that, both internally from a law enforcement perspective and community perspective. Um, brother Namdi and his brother, when they were the twin poets, I had the opportunity to meet and have a conversation with their father and the actual community advisory board that came to my academy uh, when I first came on there. And they were individuals in the community that were vested in the community. And like Ms. Congo said, they had programs, they had different things that they could go to. Moving forward with, you know, as far as in this administration, basically hasn't been anything done differently what, um, from my perspective, as far as community engagement and developing and understanding and trust and trying to find out what are the actual problems and what are the solutions that collectively we all will get together to do. So yes, we do have, you know, technology with ShotSpotter. We do have any things with Nivens. We've making arrests and all those things, but even those things with technology and all those things that have happened, we still hear the echoes and cries from the community. So it has to be something more. We have to look at the root cause. And so I, I thank Brother Namdi for allowing me to come in, uh, but I think that moving forward collectively, we have to stop pointing fingers, blaming one another, and look at what is the real issue as far as trying to save the community at large and specifically those who are in, 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 um, affected by this violence. Thank you, Captain Akil, and thank you for the, the work you've done throughout your, your career in, in our community. When we think of community police relationships, I, I, I know firsthand without even asking a question, your name always comes up, up first because that is truly who you are. And as we speak of the need for that, that relationship between our, our law enforcement and our community, that bridge, you, you are truly one of the gatekeepers for, for that bridge. Thank you for, again, for the work you've done and thank you for being a member of, of this subcommittee. Thank you. We, we wanted to take a moment to go back for a second. We, we spoke a little last meeting about how we got to where we are and, and trying to find paths forward. And I'm, I'm receiving a lot of emails and, and texts about video. So I'm not sure if the video is, is just gonna be not on, uh, but I just wanted to, to let individuals know that about where we are right now and try to, to get a, sen a sense of, of, of a path going forward. And looking at where we are, when we, we spoke as a, a, a Black Caucus about our, our justice for all agenda, in the issues that, that we wanted to present to try to address some of the disparities that, that negatively impacted the African-American communities through, throughout our state. One of those issues was, was indeed gun, community violence and, and, and gun violence and the safety of, of our communities and the, the impact of, of, that the justice system has on, on our communities and trying to find equity and fairness through not only legislatively, but also through policies and, and the programs and, and services that are administered by, by our state and also our, our stakeholder and partner not nonprofit organizations. As I thought about the, the importance of, of wanting this to be one of our, our priority areas, the, the onus and in, in the charge of our task force and in, in being able to address this very important issue, it, it, it made me think of why. We, we Ms. Congo just mentioned losing her, her son. And there are so many voices 
of, of, of parents, voices of, of, of grandparents and nieces and nephews and cousins and family members and, and neighbors and other loved ones who have that, that story, including my, myself. And for, for years, past three decades and plus, I, I, I've mentored students in my work in, in Wilmington. And very often, countless times, I've lost individuals very close to me, students who, who were, were close to me, students I mentored and, and coached and, and, and just were a part of their lives. And one individual, uh, a young man named, named Kevin, his mother, uh, he, he was killed literally a, a few blocks from my home at, at the intersection of, of Lee Boulevard and, and Market Street. And his mother had asked me if I would say some words at, at his home going service. And I wanted to say something then about what, what was happening in, in our communities, what, what we could do in order to begin to, to change, to bring forth something for, for our, our students to, to show how deadly our streets were becoming and, and almost in a sense that it seemed that if you weren't the, the immediate family or the immediate block or that community, it, it, it didn't mean anything to you, almost like, like it, it never happened. And I, I wrote this poem in, the, in this in, entitled Inner City Shadows and it, it's, it's written from the, the stance of truly thinking of a, a, on a hot summer day and you're, you're outside and your shadow's there and you see your shadow. And when, but when the, the, the sun shifts or, or clouds and that shadow is gone, no one cries, no one, you know, your shadow's just gone. And it was almost that same sense for so many of our inner city youth that they, they were just shadows, that they were just going and that impact really didn't impact that their, their laws really didn't impact anyone beyond their immediate families. And I, I wanted to just share this to, to begin our, our conversation today, just to take everyone to that, that place, that place of us hurting, that, that place of us truly seeking a solution to, to something that, that's plaguing our communities throughout our state. And again, this poem is entitled, Inner City Shadows. Little kids try to live their life all nice and clean, but the inner city is gritty and the dirt gets all in between their self-respect and their self-esteem. And by the time they're 13, they've given up on their hopes and their dreams, willing to settle for whatever life brings, wasting time chasing shiny things. It's hard for him to sleep because of the screams. He hasn't even seen 16, yet he's seen some things that have turned a preacher into a fiend. And you can look in his eyes and see that he's scared because tomorrow's coming and he know he's not prepared. His future looks blank like them tees that he wear. And to him, God is just like his father. He's never been there. He never felt this hand. He lives his life just like his cell phone, has a worthless plan. Just wasting money and minutes, running circles for gimmicks. The race thought in his finish, he does a crime, gets caught and sentenced, labeled a menace but really just a troubled teen who has trouble sleeping because he dreams of a father he's never seen. So he stays up late trying to make that cream. His fate is a murder scene. Then it's another murder, another family having another funeral, another mother passing out having spasms. I swear if you sit silently in a church, you can hear the devil laughing. Again, I, I wanted to share and that just to begin the beginning of our conversation, that that is the, the reason to me why we are here. That is our, our, our purpose, our, our true charge of trying to do what we can to literally save lives, to save lives in, in our communities throughout, throughout the state that are being impacted by, by community violence. And in, in 2014, our, our city council president, I'm not sure if she was able to join us this morning, uh, but our city council president for the city of Wilmington, council president Hanifa Shabazz, presented a, a resolution and a request for the national CDC to come to Wilmington because of our elevated rates of, of, of gun violence. And she said then that, that it was a pandemic, that, that 
our, our children dying in the street that was at pandemic proportions and, and there was no reason for it to be this way, that there were things that, that could be done. And we felt as a council then, as we, we still feel now, that there was a need for us to begin to truly address gun violence and looking at it from, looking at it from a, a public health perspective. And so this, the CDC came and, and they conducted a, a study and, and the purpose of the study was to use state and administrative data to identify risk factors for firearm involvement and to use those factors to focus efforts on prevention. Data sources and, and other departments who, who were involved were the Departments of Services for Children, Youth and Family, Delgis, Department of Education, Department of Labor, and Christina Care Health Systems. The sample study was for Wilmington residents who were arrested for violent firearm crime in the city between January 1st, 2009 and May 21st, 2014. In total, there were 569 individuals identified. 95% of them were, were male and 71% were younger than 30. The strongest risk factors for involvement for firearm crime, the ER visits, a visit for a, a shot, gunshot wound, ER visit for stabbing, a ER visit involving the police, a history of being a social assistance program recipient, unemployment in the quarter preceding the crime, and residential detention as a juvenile. I remember when these indicators were, were first presented, I remember sitting in the city council uh, conference room and the CDC was presenting its findings and immediately jumped in, into my mind. I said, well, right now we've just identified who, who we need to be providing services to. I mean, we, we, we just clearly identifying them. There's a picture of, of these young men and young ladies right here in this picture. So it always said to me, like, we, we know who we need to target for these preventative services. Next slide. The study recommendations were to increase collaboration between social service agencies in preventing violence by linking and sharing data. Refine the study's pilot risk assessment by using the full administrative data set focus the risk assessment on youth. Social service providers should use the risk assessment and prohibit law enforcement, prohibit law enforcement to use the risk assessment. Establish the community advisory board to provide recommendations on evidence-based wraparound services and programs for high risk use in conjunction with the risk assessment tool. So these were our recommendations. And of these recommendations, the, the city did establish the Community Advisory Board, the Wilmington Community Advisory Board, which was formerly known as the C CDC Advisory Board. So that was established. And there were, I, I would say some movement in some of the other recommendations, but uh, the big ones, of course, linking and, and sharing data, those have, uh, have always remained barriers for various reasons. And then the use of the, the assessment for providing the, the supports and needed supports, preventative programming, guidance, and, and just assessment for our youth, they, they truly weren't fully implemented. So that's where we wanted to begin our, our discussion today of having reviewed the, the recommendations and to, to, to pick up from there. I, I had a, a very interesting conversation yesterday with our, our no, Monday with, with our, our chief, uh, Chief Tracy in Wilmington. And, and we were just talking about guns in, in, in our city and, and the shootings and, and COVID. And it, it brought us to the point of truly trying to understand how things aren't getting, ha haven't gotten better. They're, they're truly getting worse. And, and he told me, uh, our, our current juveniles, we have 40, 44 juveniles who, who have been arrested this year 
in the city of Wilmington with, with, with guns. And, and this is, uh, I believe last year there, there were 15 or maybe 19 and, and then a year before there were 15. So it's, it's almost double. And, and for us to really think that every year where we, we're seeing this increase. So for us to think about what we need to do as, as providers, what we need to do as law enforcement agencies in order to, to create those, those support systems and provide the preventative services for our youth to help bring down the, the gun violence. So again, we wanted to start our, our conversation here and just look at our, these recommendations and, and just to get input, uh, suggest things about where, how, how do we move forward from here? And uh, again, our, our goal for our subcommittee is to come forward with, with recommendations for, for policy changes or rec recommendations for legislative change for that, that would support change legislatively that the Black Caucus will, will, will present through for as a part of this justice for all agenda. So I'll stop there and, and I will open up the floor for, for questions or, or just comments on the CDC study. Uh, hello, this is James Sherrod. Uh, as I read the study, I think one of the things that I, one of the questions that I have is how do we communicate this information and recommendations to the general populace um, on TV when companies want to sell products and things like that? Uh, they put out uh, either ads on TV, ads on the radio. Uh, we put up um, billboards and things of that nature, but say, so yes, the plan is fine, but it doesn't, I, I, I see the loophole being if you don't get the information out to the, to the community to let them know that these services are available and where they're located and the cost of those things, it kind of presents a, a block. So anyway, those, those, that was just one of the concerns that I had when I read the report. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. And absolutely, we always know, I mean, as far, it's the hardest part of, of those, I guess, social service work is, is that level of engagement. It's the hardest part. It's, it's the hardest part to understand. And it's also the hardest part to truly get a gauge of. Yet there, there, there are never enough resources to, to fully do engagement the, the way it, it needs to be done. I mean, that true level of engagement in, inside of the community, how to get recommendations uh, across. Are there any more comments regarding engagement or other recommendations? This is Gil Crosby. I'd like to say something. Yes, sir. And uh, I don't know, there's no hand raising function or anything. So I hope I'm not just butting in the wrong way, but uh, well, you and I have discussed the, the uh, methodology called CRID, which is uh, a way of allowing people to sort through expert advice and studies and then adapt them to the local community. And, and I, I uh, didn't catch in that whole story uh, what are the social service providers and the law enforcement professionals were somehow allowed and given the opportunity and, and the general community to uh, kick around the recommendations and then come up with their own uh, ways to assist in implementation. Uh, but that's often where things fall apart is if there's a study and then it's forced on agencies and forced on people, uh, then they tend to uh, not help they don't, they don't help in the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. And, and we will speak a little later on in our agenda. Give, you'll be able to give an overview of, of, about the uh, CRID and how it, it can be used and how we believe it can be useful in, in assisting us with our, our task at hand for our subcommittee. But you're absolutely right when thinking about implementation strategies. One of the, the charge uh, that, that was implicitly added for our 
Delaware Legislative Black Caucus are, are charged for our justice for all agenda for both the, the law enforcement task force as well as the African American task force was not only come up with legislative recommendations, but also to come up with, with community-based implementation strategies that, that can support what, what's going on legislatively and getting that message into the community. So we do realize that these are, are areas of concern and, and true areas of need to be considered going forward. The uh, last thing I'll add, uh, yes, thank sir. you, is that I, I would even uh, find a way to include the high-risk youth in thinking about how to fix the problem if if I were designing, uh, you know, an approach to this. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Other input? Yes, this is John Stevenson representing the kids department. And so uh, when this CDC recommendations came out, I wasn't sitting in this position as director of YRS at the time. And so I'm looking at the focus on risk assessment for youth. So the department does have a risk assessment for youth. Um, it's called the impact, it's the positive achievement change tool. And I'm not quite sure if that was taken in consideration or that's the tool that they were looking for. So that tool is used for both a low risk and high risk youth to determine um, where they go, where they're placed um, and what recommendation we as a department makes towards the court to, um, to the court to recommend either placement or community-based services for them. So I would love to have a probably offline conversation about that uh, assessment tool because we do have a current assessment tool that's been in place probably since 2014 to 2015. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. We would love to follow up with you re regarding that, that assessment tool and how it's being used and how we could, uh, if need be, broaden it, its use. But thank you for, for sharing. Additional comments? Yeah, it's uh, Captain Akil. Um, if someone could just expound on some of the uh, risk assessments that they want to prohibit, um, I really would like to hear, you know, maybe it's jumping ahead, but I really would like to hear from the panel or those within the social service community. I have an assessment, you know, from my experience of being in the street and being in law enforcement, what I think would uh, help and engage in some of this. But I'd like to hear about some of the things of uh, they want to prohibit law enforcement uh, or what we have been using traditionally that has been, um, counterproductive and um, some of the studies as, as, as de-escalating violence. If someone could expound on that for me, please. Are there any members present from our, our social service department? Um, this is Tanita Congo. I work in the Division of State Service Centers. Um, we work closely with the Division of Social Services. So I would imagine um, from my point of view where I'm at, because um, we see a variety of people all the time. And if we had like resources or like a packet of information that we could share with our clients while we're servicing their needs and we're picking their brain and see what their needs are. And maybe we can help in getting that information out that way as well. Absolutely. Are there any additional comments regarding the recommendation or maybe additional recommendations that you think should have been taken into consideration? I know well, Representative, uh, I'm sure. sorry, this is Gil Crosby again, I'll be brief. I just uh, think that uh, the captain's question is uh, clear. It, clearly points to that there was not enough dialogue between the various people who would be implementing and influenced by this thing. If uh, he has to ask now what was being prohibited, uh, I, clearly at least he was not invited into some sort of dialogue about uh, you know, the study early on. So anyway, I, I hope that we can increase that dialogue going forward around any recommendations, any strategies. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think that, and I, I say this as a, a former member of, of city council, I know we had requested for, for the study 
and and then individuals showed up to perform the study and there, there were a lot of individuals and, and partners and agencies involved and there were uh, i believe one or two like updates and then we we were given a, a report so i could definitely understand captain akil's point of that that level of engagement and i think it, it goes back to to all of the comments about how do we really engage the stakeholders and and, and the community in this process, not not only in you know from the after effect of, of for implementation, but also being a part of the study, to being a part of creating re recommendations. As we thought about the the body, this body's makeup, and and how we could have uh, a, 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 a a body that that's you know, truly vast enough to to try to address this this very sensitive topic and, and one that that touches you know the, the, the core of individuals and, and sometimes it puts you here and puts you there but one in which it, it, it brings to bear everybody everybody's position and, and and gives light and gives credence to their their voice to be a part of this because i truly feel in order for us to to make some some headways and, and gains in this area we need to hear from everyone. We we need every every department, every organization. We need our, our community's voice to, to, to be heard in order to help guide and, and influence legislation and, and policies and, and how we can begin to turn the tide on the violence in, in, in our community. Miss Miss Congo, if you don't mind, if if I could ask you to speak from a, a community perspective and a parent's perspective, how do you see? Or what recommendations would you think could be added to continue or, or expand upon this work? Um, number one, from a parent perspective, there's nothing for these kids to do. And the idle mind is the devil's playground. When I was coming up in Wilmington, we had the Boys and Girls Club, we had the community centers, you know, we could go to the park, we had free lunch in the summertime. And, now I'm even scared to take my grandkids to the park because there's razor blades in the grass. So I think first and foremost, activities need to be brought back because our kids have nothing to do when they're just standing on the street or, or picking fights with one another. Um, there is no real presence of the Big Brother, Big Sister program. I know that we have it, but I don't see you know, any type of mentoring going on or, or anything. It's like nothing. Even when I lost my son to gun violence and I went to victim services, yeah, they helped me with the funeral, but after that, that was it. It was like, okay, you can go here and get grief counseling, or you could go here and get this, or you can go there and get that. They were like, sorry for your loss. Here's $5,000 for your funeral. And that was it. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're just left. We're left stuck. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And then just watching these kids run up and down the street. I understand parents have to work, but I, I was a latchkey kid. There was always something to do or some program to be in. And it's not there. Right. And that's another reason why I started my foundation, because as we grow, we're going to implement um, the, the mentoring program where we reached out to Job Corps, um, we reached out to AmeriCorps. It's things we're trying to get in place now so that we can get those relationships established and help get these kids off the street and doing something productive. And we're working with um, Duffy Samuels to get the basketball league um, teams going. And so they'll have some form of activity. Thank you. Thank you for the, those strong recommendations. I'm and sorry I, I went off on a tangent, but- No, that's, that's, that's really not a tangent. I, I really believe, I mean, when we think about that that last bullet there that's, that's being showed about the wraparound and support services, that I mean, that those are everything you're talking about. And it really takes a, a, a concentrated, true, heartfelt in, investment, not something that's going to be temporary or, or you, you, you receive this grant award and you do this program to the funding runs out and then you're, you're left to your own demise, but really a, a systematic approach involving our, our, our local governments, our state governments, federal governments, in partnership with, with our nonprofits, with, with, with our schools, our community-based organizations to or, 
organize and implement these support services that truly, as we say, wrap these services around our children, those who are at high risk. We, we know who they are. I mean, we, we've seen identification. It was clear as day who they are. We So to provide these services it has always been one, one in which it, it leaves me scratching my head about why we can't do a better job of, of providing those support services. And it, it's truly about establishing those, those partnerships, those, those, those alliances. And it, it's, we can't just think that, it, I mean, it's all on, on government services. It really truly has to be private and public partnerships, all of us working together for the best interests of our communities, for, for our, our children, for the, the true future of our state, for, for our nation. And when we begin to think in those terms that, that we're doing this for, for tomorrow, not that we're doing this for, for, for a program or we're doing this to, to meet this recommendation, but we're truly doing this to, to make a difference in the lives of our children. We're doing this to, to save lives. I think that's when it begins to, to truly matter. And, and that's when it really has the, the impact that we want it to have, not, not just as far as that we completed the study, but the fact that we're, we're truly doing something and having recommendations that, that are come from the community and, and truly for the community. Mr. Mr. Mackler, is there, would, would there be any additional recommendations that you think could be uh, added or ways in which these could, can be enhanced? Um, thanks, Representative. I have one, although it's not, you know, I'm sure you're asking me because I'm, I'm representing the AG's office. I have one that's not necessarily directly related to, to the Department of Justice, which is, as we're all aware, right, we're living in a pandemic and all of the issues that Ms. Congo um, so beautifully articulated are exacerbated by the fact that we're living in a pandemic. And in this instance, I think one area where we can, where we can focus is we have a lot of kids who aren't in school. Um, uh, that makes all of, the, all, every, all of our um, shortcomings as a society and as a city are only made worse by the fact that the schools aren't open, right? Um, and that's everything from kids having a place to go to kids being able to eat. Uh, and certainly as, as Mr. Stevenson knows better than anybody, uh, it, it means more violence, right? Um, and so I think it, it would really be worthwhile, even though it is hopefully a short-term issue to figure out um, what we can do as a city and as a community uh, to try and give these kids, you know, it was said before, idle hands are the devil's playground. Uh, what can we do while these kids aren't in school to try and get them stuff to do uh, and try and keep eyes on them? Because in our best times, we have, we have challenges with um, a lot of these kids in the city and these are not the best times. So that, that, I, I think that's obviously a big, look, the CDC study obviously didn't focus on that, it was years ago, um, but that would be an additional area where I think we could use everyone's expertise as long as we're dealing with this very acute issue of schools being closed during the pandemic, what can we do to, to try and get a little bit more attention uh, and, and get these kids a little bit busier with stuff to do? Absolutely, definitely appreciate that. And I, I, I know the challenges from the, the various hats I wear and being in, in various meetings and leading our, our Reading Consortium for Educational Equity, just the challenges of, of trying to address the educational and me mental health and social support needs for, for our students during this pandemic is so challenging. I mean, for, for our, our district partners, for our state, even at the federal level, for all, all schools, it is challenging and, and really give, gives us a sense of really looking at what, what are the gaps in services and giving us a, a, a opportunity to reimagine how, how we provide education services, how we also how we re provide those support services to our, our students and their families. It, it has to be done through a, through a new lens of, of this is a new opportunity for growth rather than focusing on, on the challenges, meaning that the pandemic that is, that is upon us. Ms. Minitola, would you have any recommendations? Um, I just wanted to uh, elaborate a little bit more on the recommendation that it's social services providers that we should rely upon in using these risk assessments um, versus law enforcement. Um, and while I, um, I, I don't have an answer as to why that actually is in the study, um, because there's not really a lot of um, information about that in the study, from my own experience, I think oftentimes we need to get clients buy-in um, in order to avail themselves of these various um, services that um, they can use. 
And I think some of it's a, a trust factor. And I think if some of our clients feel that this is coming um, from more of a law enforcement perspective and they may end up being um, arrested or violated on probation, if they're not participating in those programs, they're gonna be less likely to um, take advantage of them. Um, instead, if they're coming more from a social services provider's um, perspective and they're not necessarily going to be um, in trouble if they're not 100% compliant, I think that that's maybe where the focus is and where why maybe social services needs to take the lead on trying to implement some of these um, programs that would be useful based on the risk assessments. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Definitely, definitely key and, and very guided statement. Thank you. Are there any additional uh, recommendations or points individuals wanted to make regarding the recommendations from the CDC? Again, as, as we think about where we are in trying to, to, to look forward, what we wanted to do was to, to truly utilize this as, as a starting point, as a point in, in which we, we feel that it provided a very valuable position regarding the, the, the violence in, in some of our, our, our communities, especially our high need communities in Wilmington and gave us a, 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 at least a, the beginning of a blueprint for, for ways in which it could be systematically addressed. Now, working together with, with the Black Caucus, it is our goal to try to expand upon these recommendations and, and hopefully to provide additional supports uh, and add on additional recommendations that, that we believe that can be more, that can allow these recommendations or, or the outcomes from the recommendations to be more effective in having a true impact on, on, on the violence in our city. We, we believe that that the study was very groundbreaking. I mean, it, to truly have the CDC come to our city was, it, it, it was, it gave us a sense of finally someone's gonna do something about the gun violence. And, and here it is years later, we, we have these recommendations. Now, I won't say any, not that anything hasn't been done because there are some great things that I feel that came from this work, you know, from rather would be the um, GBI, in the other programs, even the, the sense of just the, connect, the connectedness between all of our, our agencies, our schools, and, and the programming it itself for the advisory committee, the, the body that, that formed it, the work, the support from the, the city, county, and, and state governments to all support that work. Initially, it, it, there was funding from all three levels of, of government to help with the implementation as the years went on that, that waned away. And I, I believe the only funders now for, to, for that work are the city, but to have a truly have a consistent and, and a sustained effort is, is definitely would, would be one of the things that I think can truly help to broaden the, the, the scope of our, our, our services as well as the hopefully potential impact for, for the services provided through our recommendations. If there are no other comments on the recommendations, we'll move to the next slide. Our well, next thing we wanted to speak about, we wanted to have um, our one of our committee members, subcommittee members, Mr. Crosby, who is a social scientist. And he wanted to speak uh, uh, regarding uh, this uh, facilitation uh, strategy to, that helps individuals and, and communities begin to basically derive or, or create paths of, of engagement, paths to, to address barriers and challenges. And we ha had initially had this focus today to be a part of our, 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 our agenda for today, but because of the, the length of time that it takes to truly implement it correctly and implemented to the fidelity of the model. It's going to take more time. So we're going to bring Mr. Crosby back at a, at a later time to fully implement and to go through a, a workshop that will allow us and to, to assist us in coming up with our, our deliverables for this, this subcommittee and ways in which we can begin to formalize our recommendations and, and our, our challenges as well as our the opportunities that we would like to present from our subcommittee to our, our full body. So I, I'm gonna allow Mr. Crosby to um, speak and to just give us an overview and to, to answer any questions re regarding the, the, the process. 
Thank you, Representative. So uh, the CDC study is a great example of why the knowledge retrieval implication derivation uh, process, CRID, it's easier just to say CRID, uh, was created. Uh, it was created back in the 1960s by Ron Lippitt, who was a social scientist, uh, to make sure that when there were government studies or research studies of any sort, that they actually got used. They actually got turned into action because uh, they had already done a study on these studies. And often the results were not nearly what was hoped for by the communities. Uh, and so Ron Lippitt was a student of uh, Kurt Lewin, and by the way, I'm just going to take three or four minutes here to just give you an idea of what this is, because the idea now is that pushing it into this meeting was too much. It takes about an hour to do what I'd like to do with this group and with anyone else who's willing to participate. Uh, so that will be for a future meeting, maybe the next meeting. Uh, but uh, Kurt Lewin was the social scientist who created my profession, organization development, he did what we were trying to do here. He was hired over and over again by the US government back in the 1940s to address issues of social justice, uh, to uh, address inequity in uh, rates, labor rates, uh, to address uh, conflict uh, between different groups in the community. So uh, racial conflict, uh, he worked with youth uh, where there was gang violence. And absolutely by including the youth and in thinking about the solution. So uh, there's simple ways to quickly hear everyone's voices and to uh, and, and get your, your help with an analysis. And so here's uh, one thing that Kurt Lewin thought was really important, that there are things holding whatever's happening in place. And most attempts to solve it just come from the solution focus. Let's try body cameras, which I think is a great idea. Okay, but uh, let's distribute them to all officers and use them all the time. Okay, good. Uh, but that's only one approach and it's in the midst of a complex web. Uh, as Tainita's conversation shows us, uh, and this is, this is stuff has been done before successfully. We need uh, programs that uh, give kids something to do besides just living the world that was in that poem. So uh, we need a, a comprehensive approach. And, and, and so uh, we need everyone that would be in, affected by this as much as possible. You can't have everyone in a meeting, of course, but we could have a representation from all walks of life in this, in this planning process. And then a look at, well, what's holding things in place? What are the restraining forces that if we don't address these, it's gonna make any fine idea not work as well as it could have. Uh, so what, first thing I want to lead is an analysis by all of you of the restraining forces. What could hold things back so that 10 years from now we're scratching our heads and still facing the same problems and wondering what happened to the fine effort that we put in? And then once we've identified all of that, we can do an analysis that is of actions to address the restraining forces. So that's what I was hoping to lead even today. And uh, I think it was just going to be too much. In, in, uh, for, and you hadn't had a chance to hear this. So, uh, by the way, if any of you have questions or, or comments, and you could say them now, I'm going to stop talking in a moment. Uh, but I'd be happy to talk to anybody uh, privately also about what I'm hoping to assist, you know, to add to this process so that we can have the best possible outcome in Wilmington and Delaware. That's it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Crosby. I re really appreciate your willingness to uh, assist us. I really think the, the, that the implementation of this, the strategy will, would be very beneficial to, to our, our subcommittee, to the work that we're trying to do as far as the, assisting with, with the process of, of our deliverables and really thinking of, of how 
are, are we addressing? I think looking a little differently at, at the challenges that, that are facing our communities, even our organizations and, and, and our departments when it comes to this issue of community violence and, and, and social justice. So I think it gives us a, a very unique opportunity. I think it, it, it to me, it, it's giving us a sense of what will be different this time. I think that's the way I'm sensing it, that it's giving us a, a different approach to a different approach toward the same topic that you know, have so often, I mean, there have been so many studies re regarding the violence in, in our communities, but very rarely do we truly come up with, with something significant that, that brings everyone to the table and, and allows for truly to have input and in, in, in dialogue from, from various sectors of, of, our, of our society, from, from our government to our community, our nonprofits, our, our faith-based, and, and to have individuals who are impacted by the violence all being a part of, of this dialogue. So I think hopefully that's what we can have differently. I'm really looking forward to your, your, your facilitation of, of the, the CRID. And I think that it, it again, I, I believe it will be very beneficial as we think about our next steps for, for our subcommittee, as we think about our, our goals and our objectives that we're trying to reach as a, as a overall as an overall task force for, for the, the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus, for us as a subcommittee to begin to present our deliverables. And, and I think your process will definitely aid and assist us in that and coming up with our, our details of our, our deliverables to present to our full body when we, we make those recommendations. And, and with that, from our subcommittee standpoint, our, after our, our first meeting, there were a, a few meet, uh, emails that came back and forth uh, to me from members of the subcommittee regarding just trying to find a, a sense of how their, their voice, their platform, what their experience, what, what they bring to the subcommittee can be most beneficial to us. So we were trying to figure out ways and I, I've had a few uh, individual phone calls and some Zoom calls with individuals just to try to get a sense from their department or, or from their organization standpoint, how they see they could best support the work of, of this subcommittee. So we're still going through that process of, of trying to, to figure out that I guess are our, our areas of, of focus. There are definitely a, a, a few as far, as far as some, some of our of uh, uh, ongoing work with the Department of Justice, some of the, the uh, justice bills and juvenile justice reform bills that, that are being addressed there. As I mentioned uh, earlier, there was a, a call this week with our, our, the, the chief from the Wilmington Police Department, Chief Tracy, and just trying to get a sense on just the accessibility of guns and, and gun laws in our state, ways in which we can try to, to reform them and even tried to have some, some, I guess, more engaged laws or gun laws or, or more detailed, I guess, enforcement of, of our laws because a lot of what I'm, I'm hearing are that the, the laws are fine. We, we just really need more, more thorough enforcement and, and detailed enforcement of our, some of our gun laws that, that could assist us greatly with having a greater sense of, of, of safety in our community. So trying to figure those areas out. And then we're, we're also would be working on trying to establish some, some public hearings for, for this subcommittee and, and truly getting the voice of our community into our, our recommendations going forward and having a, a detailed process about ways in which that, that, that occurs. So again, Mr. Crosby, thank you for, for your willingness to, to assist our subcommittee and what I'll do now is that I don't know if there are any direct questions for, for Mr. Crosby regarding his, the implementation or, or the, the process strategy that he described. If so, I will give uh, the committee members the opportunity to ask so we can have those just clarify so that we will be, be in a good place, uh, a firm foundation for our, our next meeting when you present. Okay. Well, what you could all do between now and the next meeting is think about what you think are the most important social and other factors that are keeping things stuck the way they are, or they could undermine our efforts.
Thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, again, we will make sure that's noted in our minutes that we send out and, and definitely as a, a homework assignment for in preparation for our next meeting. I, I just received a, a text from uh, City Council President Hanif Shabash. She's not going to be able to join us, but I definitely wanted to that she was very interested in uh, being a part of, of this conversation about the CDC and trying to follow up on, on, on the recommendations and, and, and moving it forward. Are there any uh, additional comments from subcommittee members regarding uh, just areas of, of focus or deliverables, potential deliverables from this, this subcommittee? And again, I, I, I say this in, in all, you know, the, 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 the bottom of my, of my heart and, and the true heartfelt just saying that I'm, I'm thankful to be the, the committee chairman and thankful to be a, a representative. And I, but first and foremost, I, I, I am a, a resident of, of this great state, just like each and every one of you. And, and I know what it means to, to, to live in a community being impacted by, by gun violence, a city that's impacted. So I, I speak first and foremost from, from that standpoint. And, and I'm asking e each of you to that to, to know that your voice is, is, is needed, valued and, and appreciated in this conversation. And our, we can't do our work without you. So again, I, I will ask for, for comment and, and, and knowing that your, your comments, your, your input are, are truly valued and they're needed to help us go move this forward in, in a way that will be successful, not only for our, our subcommittee, but in, Intel for the, the full African-American task force committee in the overall justice for all agenda. So uh, I, I would welcome comments from members of, of our subcommittee to, to just add on into as far as details, focus on our, our deliverables and also other areas of, of, of focus that they believe should be added. So we, we will uh, again make sure that when we uh, our, our next committee meeting, when Mr. Crosby will do have his his presentation, that we allow that this is definitely going to happen with the the sense of having that level uh, of engagement where this is truly about bringing your your voice to the, this conversation. Each one of us uh, re represents the organization in, in a, a department. It's very key and, and very. It's a, a truly, in order for us to move forward, each one of us is needed. There was a, a email, a, a Google poll that was sent out regarding our upcoming meetings. I believe it's going to be uh, sent out again. There was no um, confirmation as far as um, having concrete days that, that met the scheduling for, for everyone. So it was going to be sent out again. I know there is our efforts underway of, of scheduling not only for this subcommittee, but for the other subcommittees, as well as for the full African American task force. They're all currently underway. So hopefully what we'll get soon is not only meeting dates or potential meeting dates for this committee, but all of the other committees, as well as the, the full committee for the, the full African American task force to have those meetings. So please be on the lookout for that email. Uh, regarding uh, the, the future meeting and, and scheduling. And quickly, if you could, with, with um, some haste, please uh, return the email with, with your, your preference of, of days for our, our future meetings so that we can get our meetings scheduled and on the calendar as, as soon as possible. Mr. Representative? Clark. Yes, sir. I just wanna be really clear that I'm not really gonna make a presentation uh, I'm going to lead a, a group dialogue yes, about, sir. yeah, so I just want people to know that you'll be talking more than Absolutely, and, and, and I, I, I apologize for calling the presentation. No problem, no problem. It's actually, I mean, truly we want to engage everyone in, in this work and, and having a facilitated workshop that aids us in, in that engagement and, and bringing everyone in, into this conversation. Thank you, sir. Next slide. So we're gonna open up uh, for Q&A for our, our task force members. And I, I, if 
I would truly ask that, that if every member of our task force could uh, at least give a question or, or statement, it would be uh, greatly appreciated so that we can hear from all, all of our, our participants. And I will go through our, our list of panelists who are present and just ask for uh, questions or uh, other comments that you might want to add. And I'll start on my list with Mr. Mackler. Thanks, Representative. I think I have probably a, a statement and a question. Um, the statement is, in addition to the other stuff that, that we talked about earlier, um, I just, uh, I, I want to, I want to sort of figure out a way, I want everyone to be aware as I, as I know most people are on this call, and I know you are, of the ongoing um, uh, group violence intervention effort that the governor has gone uh, in the city of Wilmington when we're talking about, obviously we're talking about violence and, and, and youths, um, and it is increasingly focused on, uh, you know, younger adults at a minimum. And I wanna make sure that we're at least aware of that um, intense and ongoing effort that's driven by the governor and his, and his agencies uh, in, in that realm. Uh, my question, which I, I don't think can be answered now is you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the overwhelming number of guns in our city and, and it's not unique to our city, obviously, just like this increase in violence is not unique to our city. Um, my question is, uh, you know, for the politicians involved, what is the, uh, you know, once we get, and this is a post-November question, um, but, but what is the um, desire for changes in our gun laws? I, I will speak only for the attorney general that, that she feels very strongly um, that we need changes to our gun laws. And I, I think we're, we're curious um, what the appetite for that will be uh, in the political world uh, once we get past November. And obviously there will be several new members of both the House and the Senate caucuses. Uh, so that, that's something that I, I think we ought to maybe revisit in our next meeting. Absolutely. And I, and I know that we, we definitely intend to make it a, a, a strong push and a, a part of our Justice for All agenda to truly have some type of um, just gun reform and, and looking at our, our gun laws statewide and, and especially in particular how they impact areas that, that are truly being challenged by, by gun violence. But thank you for, for that. Thank you. My list next, Mr. Mackler, I have you next on my list. I'm sorry, Mr. Mackler got you. Mr. Crosby, I know you spoke, but I didn't know if you had any additional uh, questions or, or comments. Well, just that I'm excited. I appreciate uh, the way that you're willing to take a risk of uh, letting me assist the way I'm suggesting it. And anything like gun laws is fair game for the process I'm talking about. So uh, clearly one of the restraining forces there is people who don't want us to change any gun laws. Right. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about this. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mr. Shabart. Uh, yes, I just have um, one thing that I'm concerned about. We we've talked in the in the study, it, it at least it talked about the education process, and I'm wondering, given all of the things that our educators have to do, the teachers, etc., if there's um, consideration for bringing the uh, the educators into the conversation to uh, help us look at uh, not only the curriculum, but also discipline and things of that nature to get their input in addressing some of the issues. Uh, uh, I don't know about the gun violence and things of that nature, but I would think that part of what is, was outlined uh, in the CDC study was the educational system. And uh, I, I've had a sense uh, just being fairly new to the area, that uh, somehow the education system has not been 
at least included in some of these issues? Yes, and as far as the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus and the African American Task Force, the committee or subcommittee that is addressing education, I'm sure there will be some overlap, but the subcommittee that's being uh, chaired by uh, State Representative Dorsey Walker, the economics and education, that's a part of, of that task force. I know there is a meeting, and again, I mentioned earlier of being, I'm the co-chair for the governance of the Reading Consortium. And I know there is a meeting between the chair, uh, Senator Lockman and um, Representative Dorsey Walker to try to, to speak about that, the relationship between the two, uh, the, the consortium and the African-American task force and about how recommendations from the Reading Consortium can be included in the overall justice for, for all agenda and the, the recommendations that come for, from, from that task force. So it is definitely a, a part, and, and as far as I know, there, there is, um, uh, has been conversations regarding curriculum and, and uh, recommendations from our, our educators, as well as um, uh, references to, to funding change. Those things are being mentioned. In, in that subcommittee's work, and I'm, I'm sure will be included in, in the recommendations from there. Um, I have James Deanna. Yes, Representative, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thank you. I just have a, a quick comment, but um, I'm a uh, community uh, police officer at heart and uh, it is near, very near and dear to me. And I have to um, agree with Ms. Congo that um, the community centers, the power centers have to be utilized better. I know it's tough during this pandemic, but we do have to have our youth be able to go somewhere and uh, feel safe. And I am looking forward to looking with my good friend, Captain Nikhil, um, to give him any support that he needs and work as a partnership. And I was thinking maybe uh, the possibility, I know that they have a upcoming uh, police academy is to at some point during the academy have a, a really strong engagement in the community and to have the recruits uh, go and, and meet and talk to the residents and find out what how they feel. Um, so maybe that might be uh, something that could be done in the near future with the academy. So. Um, that's pretty much I have right now, Representative. Thank you, thank you, James. I, and I really like that that recommendation. I, I know there have been a, a few different approaches to beginning that that level of engagement with, with our recruits, but something like that uh, I think can be very beneficial a, a, as well. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. Stevenson. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. Um, we uh, continue to work with the YRS and the whole department on trying to assist in any efforts that there are to stop some of the gun violence in the city. We've revamped many of things that we've done, including looking at our GPS monitoring and looking at how we deploy officers to work with Wilmington Police um, Department um, to make sure that we are helping to initiate the uh, GBI uh, intervention. Um, in addition, I do believe that at some level, I think Ms. Congo says it best as far as we need to look at the front end. By the time sometimes the kids touch our door here at YRS, we're, we're sort of too late. We're too late into the game. Um, and we really need to focus on the prevention and how do we stop these kids from getting into the game in the first place. So I think that needs to be an area that uh, we look at because, you know, when they hit one of our detention centers, they're already getting involved and in, um, uh, not that we can't help them and help rehabilitate them and get them back into the community in the best way that, you know, meets their needs and, and their risks and, and, and what's our responsivity to those needs and risks. Um, but, you know, we need to figure out a way, how do we get them before they get there in the first place? Absolutely. Definitely. And I think that really brings onus to, to the overall recommendation from the CDC study about those preventative services and, and those wraparound support prevention services that are so desperately needed that we all know can, can truly make a difference and ha have an impact. So thank you, sir. Ms. Minitola. Um, it's hard to follow Director Stevenson because he took a little bit of my thunder there <laughs> because I actually was also going to um, talk about the, the prevention and really the front end. Um, I, I've often said the same thing that he has said that once those um, um, 
children or young adults um, become public defender clients, um, it's oftentimes too late because we've failed them um, you know, before they entered the system. And so I am glad to see that the focus is going to be on children and young adults, um, 18, 19, 20 year olds. And as many of us who have children that age know, they, they still really are children at that age in many ways that they function. And so being able to um, take a holistic approach and it's not just the individual, but it's their family, um, it's the community they live in, it's the schools. Um, you know, all, we need to look at all those areas um, because they all have an impact on that individual um, child who's coming into the system. And how can we make um, things better by a holistic approach and not just narrowing on just the ch child and these are just the services that child needs. It really is what does the family and the community at large need as a whole. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. And next I have Megan Mullinex. Uh, hello, Representative. Um, I'm a staff member. Uh, okay, so sorry. Can... Yeah, Thank no you. problem. Okay. Uh, Sean, I mean, uh, Spence Price. Thank you, Representative. Um, just a couple of things, I guess, first, personally, um, uh, the poem that you provided really frames and it touched me personally, but really frames what we're here to do and what we're what we're trying to prevent and assist with. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. It really gives us some some perspective. Um, two things about that poem that you mentioned: the first, twice, the lack of a father figure, um, and then secondly, uh, the viewpoint from a teenager. So I think those are just two things that that kind of stood out to me throughout that poem. Um, might give us some guidance later. Uh, professionally. Um, my agency is more of a support agency. Um, we, we support the criminal justice agencies throughout the state um, with research and analysis to develop policies and, and support um, different things and initiatives uh, throughout the state. Um, we do do a statewide shooting report. Um, I'll provide that to the staff to disseminate. Um, we, we highlight the city of Wilmington as well within that. And there's some, um, some interesting facts throughout, uh, you know, victim and uh, suspect information that I think might benefit um, some discussions later. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And last I have Ms. Congo. Hello, thank you again. Um, my whole thing coming to you all from my foundation, like I said, is we support those affected by gun violence. And what we wanna bring to the table is we want to make sure that the children are okay and they're getting what they need while we're helping the parent grieve the loss of their loved ones by going through the stages of grief and all of that. So we want to take a holistic approach. And with that, while we're dealing with these, these um, clients, with these families, when we see what their needs are, we can refer them to, to this person or to that person and we can help them make sure that their need is met while making sure that the kids are okay at the same time and that they're not left to their own devices. And I say that because I look at my son's children, my son left behind a three-year-old and a one-year-old one when he got killed. And um, their mother is struggling with these kids. So what, how do we help her? You know, how do we help the parent that's left with raising the kids by herself? You know, she, she's mourning the loss of her, you know, the loss of her loved one while taking care of his children. So what services and things are out there for her? How do we help her? How do we help other families like that where they're just down to one breadwinner and, and they're, they're grieving, but they have other children to take, to take care of. And then those children are just left. So that's how they're out there and they're they're getting attention from the wrong type of people. And so that that's an, another thing that my organization wants to help with. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And and last input and comments questions are, will be for Captain Akil. Thank you. I, I I think that uh, my, my main comment or concern is what is the end game and how much are you willing to put in and what's going to be the cost for you, meaning you as an organization, you as an individual, 
to really get this done. This is the same conversation we've had, our grandparents said, and going back. This is not a new thing that's going and success of our children. That's gonna take a lot of sacrifices, a lot of egos, a lot of uh, things that goes on the board. We have to eradicate a lot of those. Speaking from my position and where I'm at um, in my organization, as well as everybody else. I think that if we are truly committed to making, you know, uh, a better, uh, you know, what I'd say a better environment, whether it's gonna be on the preventive side, you know, uh, inter interacting when we're engaging and then in the forward, how do we, you know, keep everything so we can sustain it so we don't have to keep coming back and having these type of conversations. So I'm open. Um, I just think that we need to look at traditionally what has not worked, um, moving forward with what, 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 what we believe will work and being committed to that. Um, because I think we have to look inside ourselves and see, again, for my first point, from your poem to all of it, it talks about the individuals, how we look at the individuals who we are serving. And if we don't look at them as inclusive, then we'll be back at this conversation again. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Aq, And, and I, I truly appreciate the comments about how, how we've been here before. And, and I mean, I know, I, I believe in my heart that our, our Black Caucus really wants to do something and we want to do something not, not just here in, in Wilmington, but, but statewide, it truly has an impact that addresses many of the disparities that impact our, our community. Community violence, of, of course, to me, is one of those things that it, it, we, 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 we can do something about it. Now, I, I truly believe that in, in my heart, that if everyone plays their, their part, that it's something that, that we truly can, it's, a, it's an area that we can truly impact. And we think about what, what, hasn't, what, what hasn't worked before, we think about how many strategies have, have we had in place that, that we didn't fully implement, that, that we didn't give them the, the full just support of the various agencies, the various de departments, and, or even financial support to truly implement some of these strategies. What can we truly do different this time and to have not our only policies in place and, and try to, to look at what laws need to be changed. But I think the most important part of what we're trying to do as, as through this task force is, is to have that, that, that community implementation strategy to really figure out how we're gonna take these changes and, and make them meaningful inside of the, the community from each and one of our departments all the way to the individuals that our departments and our organizations serve to truly make them the focus and make their lives better. At, but, and as a term of it, to make their, their community safer, to give our, our children the opportunities, no matter if, if you're living in this community or, or this community, have the same opportunities to live in, in, in a safe community. Ms. Congo mentioned about not being able to take her, her, her grandchildren to the park. Those, those things are, are basic things that we, we need to, to address, though it, it addresses some core fundamental areas that, that need to be changed. They, these are, are, are desperate conditions in our communities that, that should not exist. And I, I believe that working together with, with the right strategy, that there are things that we can do to truly change this and, and not temporarily change it, but, but change it as, a, as a, a way of life and a way of, of improvement and truly uh, uh, in, in changing the environment within our communities to one that, that produces safety rather than violence. So again, thank you to all the task members for, for your, your input and for your, your suggestions. And they're, they're gonna be taken in and we're gonna see these again and hopefully they will even come into our, our work as when we work um, with Mr. Crosby and just getting uh, uh, that, that strategy and that, that way forward to, to taking all of our comments putting it into focus areas if we look at rather we're looking at the, the gun legislation or criminal justice reform thinking about recommendations and, and how can we provide the, the social service supports for for our at-risk youth and their families and in their communities how, how can we put better system in place to provide those needed support so i think our our, our task force is headed in the right direction i see a lot of areas in which we is, is starting to jail our, our our comments so i think just that's focusing a little more on, on our, our areas of, of focus as well as our, our deliverables would be very good for us going forward, a good step, next step. Um, the next agenda item I believe is public comment. 
if there are members of the public, you can uh, use the raise hand function to indicate that you would like to make a, a public comment. Your public comments can also be emailed to the African American Task Force at Delaware.gov. Thank you, Representative. Um, each person who wants to give public comment will have two minutes. I will mute, unmute rather, um, participants one at a time. And the first person who would like to give public comment is Mallory Nugent. Um, I am unmuting you. And you now have two minutes. Thank you. to speak today and for tackling these important issues. I'm Mallory Nugent. I'm Associate Regional Director of State Affairs at Everytown for Gun Safety. Uh, black people are 13 times as likely as white people to die by gun homicide in Delaware. The gun homicide rate in Delaware is 30% higher than the national rate. In an effort to reduce gun violence, especially in black communities, Black communities experience, experiencing a disproportionate impact, we recommend the subcommittee continue, continue, consider the following. Uh, permit to purchase, sometimes called licensing at the state level, requiring individuals to apply for and receive a card often referred to as a purchase permit prior to a firearm purchase gives authorities an opportunity to deny permits to those who pose a danger to public safety and complete a thorough background check, ultimately deterring prohibited in individuals from seeking a firearm. It also ensures that all firearm purchasers have completed a rigorous safety training course, as well as seriously cutting down on straw purchasing. A 2019 study found that permit to purchase requirements were associated with a 21% lower firearm homicide rate in large cities and 20% lower firearm homicide rate in suburban and rural areas. When Connecticut passed a law requiring all handgun buyers to pass a background check at both point of sale and as part of a permit purchase process, it was associated with a 40% reduction in gun homicide. We also recommend investing in community-led public safety strategies. For decades, community-based organizations have successfully reduced violence by implementing alternative public safety measures that are locally driven, informed by data, and don't require police involvement. Often referred to as violent, violence intervention programs, these strategies have expanded greatly over the years and include street outreach, group violence intervention, crime prevention for, through environmental design, hospital-based violence intervention programs, safe passage, and cognitive behavioral therapies. Communities facing gun violence crises require immediate locally driven intervention in addition to large-scale policy reform. Delaware should invest in community-led violence intervention programs along with inv robust investment in community services and resources. We also recommend making reforms to law enforcement. Uh, we, we must remember that police violence is gun violence, and in Delaware, like the rest of the country, black people are more likely to be shot by police. We've submitted recommendations to the legislature. Hey, Mallory, your two uh, minutes is up. Um, if you'd like, you can send the rest of your comments to African American Task Force at Delaware.gov. Thank you. Would anybody else like to give public comment at this time? If so, please use the raised hand function. Okay, Tyrone Jones, I will unmute you. You will have two minutes to speak. You may begin. Greetings, members of the African American Task Force. Uh, my name is Tyrone Jones, and I'm former chair of the Wilmington Community Advisory Council, still a member of the Wilmington Community Advisory Council, which has been putting forth a lot of time and effort into creating that collective, uh, collective per, um, strategy to address violence based on the CDC report. I'm glad that you had the CDC report on the agenda for today. And I'm hoping that you will have the members from the Wellington Community Advisory Council to come forth and talk through some of the recommendations that were made on the heels of that report. And some of the things that have been implemented as a result of it is going to take a lot of time and energy in order to make sure that we sustain efforts this time. Um, I've been involved in many of these uh, groups that have looked at violence over the last uh, two decades or so, three decades or so and we continue to do some really good things and then we stop. And going back to what Captain Akil and Representative Chukwoka spoke about, we cannot allow ourselves to go through this process again, come up with some of the same recommendations that are evidence-based, 
that have demonstrated impact, and yet we cannot find ways in which to sustain their progress. We've got to research them on a consistent basis, and we've got to ask the question, where can the investments come from? What policies need to be shifted and changed in order for us to have continuous impact in our community and on the lives of our young people? It will require change within our systems, whether it's our education system or children's department, corrections, whatever, but it's going to require some level of change so that we can make sure that we're centralizing the focus on the needs of kids and their families, connecting the resources to them, and hopefully moving them towards a, a place where they can continue to grow and develop and hopefully get out of the system as well as improve their lives as a whole. So I wanna commend you for the work that you all are doing, um, but we've gotta to continue to move forward with a, a goal of saying we've gotta, everything we do has to have meaningful impact Thank you, Mr. Jones. I'm sorry, your Thank two minutes you. is up. Uh, the next person who would like to give public comment is Megan Mullinex. Megan, you have two minutes to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, committee um, representative um, and Caitlin. Uh, my comment is just brief. Um, the focus on Wilmington is very important. Uh, as it is a major city, um, especially for African Americans in Delaware and for the gun violence problem. But um, I, I think that conversation relating to Dover and other uh, cities in Delaware um, should also play uh, overall and to continue to think of those communities as well. I believe statistically Dover, I think is the second um, city in Delaware in terms of uh, gun violence uh, and that the conversation continues to touch upon a geographically broad range of places um, in addition to the services in the very important city of Wilmington. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. If anybody else would like to give public comment, please use the raise hand function. It does not appear that any other attendees would like to give public comment at this time. Representative, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, i just like to thank everyone for the, the, their comments, public comments. I, I, I thank everyone regarding the, the, the guns in our, our community, the need for additional support services. And, and Mr. Jones, your, your, your history of, of service in, in this area is well documented and you definitely understand what needs to be done from creating uh, uh, founding pro project stay free community based uh, reentry program for, for youth. So definitely understand that need and what needs to be done. How can we take the, those those experiences and that voice of what needs to be done and move it forward. We, we truly understand as an African American task force, you know, it was very intentional in, uh, in the makeup of our, our committees to have uh, representatives from, from each county so that our, our input and our dialogue at the subcommittee level would, would on every committee, on every each subcommittee would, would represent each county. So we definitely want to bring in the voice of, of Kent and Sussex County uh, in dealing with this issue. We know gun violence isn't just a Newcastle County and Wilmington specific issue, but it's throughout our state. So we, we definitely realize that some of the areas that in areas that we've we've in, in I, I guess some of the challenges that we faced before that many other areas in Dover and Milton and other areas are, are starting to to see now in their community so sharing what we've uh, areas lessons learned from our our city and, and sharing them with the other areas but also having broad recommendations that can be implemented in Wilmington as well as uh, throughout Newcastle County, Kent and Sussex County. So that is definitely our, our intent for our, our recommendations. I thank the, the public for their comment and participation in our meeting today. And are there any additional items to, to be discussed from members of our, our task force subcommittee? Hearing no no other no other comments or items to, to be addressed, I again would like to thank everybody for participating, and I would like to declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.
Thank you all for participating.